Hi there, thank you for joining me for the second of uh, these brief technology impaired uh, reflections on the uh, last couple of chapters in Matthew's Gospel. Uh, today we're going to be looking at Matthew 28 verses 1 to 10 and then we're going to skip a bit in the middle that I'd encourage you to read but I've only got so much time. So 1 to 10 and then 16 to 20. Uh, so I'm going to read through those verses now. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to the tomb. There was a violent earthquake from an angel of the Lord, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and, going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He's not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come. And see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples. He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell the disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There, there they will see me. And then verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. So again, we're just going <clears> to <throat> look at these, uh, these verses and look at what they mean and just note some of the some of the things that I think are important as we go through. And I think the first thing that stands out when you when you step back and, and pay attention, I guess, is this isn't an account of Jesus' resurrection. This is an account of the discovery of Jesus' resurrection. Again, we were saying last time about the, the questions of how and what are far less significant than why. And in a sense, that's true here. The mechanics of what's happened in the resurrection aren't important. What's important is that it's it's true and that it's revealed and it's revealed first and foremost to these women. And if you're ever if you're ever wondering if that's a normal thing, that the witnesses to a really important event were women, well quite frankly, in this situation it goes against all cultural expectations. What I'm saying is that if someone made this story up, they made it up in a slightly illogical way. Because if you want to say, look, we have these very obvious and trustworthy people, in this period of time, I'm afraid, it's not very nice to say it, but women weren't exactly considered trustworthy or capable of carrying such important information. And writing it as women doing it kind of makes the, the apostles look like a, you know, it takes some of the, the wind out of their sails if they were looking to be pompous, which I'm sure they weren't, but you know what I mean. Which is all a long way of saying that the fact that women are doing it is not the way it would have been made up. This is true. This is a, a truthful and faithful account of what happened on that first uh, Easter morning. Women set out to look for the tomb. They, these are the women who'd seen Jesus buried, they'd watched him die, they saw him buried, and now they've gone to look at the tomb. You know, so many, our house here is just next to the church, how do we regularly see people just, just want to be near the, the, loved, the loved one that they've lost? It seems that's what's going on on this morning. Finally they're able to, to walk out to see that grave, to check that it's all safe. <laughs> and as they're walking, in my mind, 
the angel of the Lord sort of vaults out of heaven and lands um, on the entrance of the tomb, you know, petrifying the guards as this angelic being suddenly embodied in front of them. They're stood frozen and the angel rolls the stone away like he's the doorkeeper just waiting for the for Mary and the other Mary to arrive. And the the conversation with the with the angel has no metaphor, no figurative figurative speech. It's really a very direct, you know, Jesus was crucified. Um, remembering that crucifixion was something that was shameful. Um, if you've spent a lot of time around people who are going through grief, sometimes there's a desire to avoid direct speech around it. Um, sometimes, sadly, particularly in deaths that are, are considered to have been shameful, uh, euphemism is used, but this angel does not go in for euphemism. Jesus was crucified. There's no shame in it. He, you know, he's not here. He's risen from the dead. Go and tell the disciples. Tell them to go to Galilee. It's really direct. You know, you don't need to be afraid. This has all happened. It's all true. Now you have a job to go and do. You've been given an assignment. You know, God has chosen you to have the the honour of this witness and this mission uh, to be the first to go and tell. And... And more than that, they have this second honour to be the first to see the risen Jesus. Now they're, they're running full of fear and joy, which sounds slightly contradictory, but if, do you remember when you first became a believer? That sense that everything that you'd ever anticipated, you know, certain facts and hard, solid points in your life are now completely undone. Plans you may have had completely turned upon their heads. You know, they have just witnessed the dead rising. The whole world has changed for them, but in a really good way. So they don't know what's going to happen and that's scary, but it's a good thing. And then they meet with Jesus and Jesus, I mean, he's really laid back. The, the Greek word is sort of translated here as greetings could just be like, hello, like, hi, <laughs> not in there anymore. And as much as he seems relaxed, they are really not. And they dive at his feet and they worship him. And they grasp onto him. You know, Jesus here is no ghost. His physical presence he can be held onto. And Jesus gives them some time. And then he sends them, you know, to carry on that, that mission, that assignment. To go and speak to his disciples. You know, and then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, verse 16. You know, they hear... They're here, they go because Jesus sent them, but they didn't t talk to Jesus. The women have come and said, Jesus says you guys have to go. So the disciples, these 11, they listen to the women. They do as they're told. And they find Jesus, that old friend and teacher in the hill country of Galilee. Um, Matthew is saying, you know, they've gone back to where they started. This is their home turf and they've gone back um, to where it started. You know, there's weeks and chapter and chapter of slow journey south into this place of trial and testing and all the hardship that came there but now they're going to be back um, and you know the I'm not sure that they're really lush green pastures of Galilean hill country but in my mind they're lush green hill country and immediately some of them bow down and worship him uh, the NIV says some doubted um, it seems unlikely from the other accounts that they doubted that it was Jesus. Uh, the word can also be translated hesitated, although some kind of reluctance. Uh, which to me seems more likely. Imagine, you know, it might well be the last time they saw Jesus, they were running away, saving their own skin and letting Jesus be arrested. And so now they see him. This, He was their friend. He was their teacher. They betrayed him. Is he going to welcome them back? You know, Jewish um, teaching about worshipping other people, it's like, don't do that. So it's a whole load of cultural things to come over. And so there's this hesitation, this inertia before they can come to Jesus and worship him. And so what do we see Jesus do? He goes to them. You know, he, he steps right through their discomfort and he comes to them. And he speaks to them. You know, he's called them brothers to the women. Uh, and the words he uses now, he, he clearly includes them. You know, Jesus says he has all authority on heaven and earth is his. 
At the beginning of the gospel, we see we saw Satan offer Jesus um, all of the earth. But that wasn't Satan's to give, and Jesus rejected it. That wasn't enough. Now, Jesus, all authority in heaven and earth is his. All through the gospel, Matthew's been trying to help us to understand the unique role and position that Christ has as the Christ, as the Messiah, as the King, as the heir of David. And it's been building and building and now here we see it fulfilled in these words. Jesus finally claiming the fullness of his inheritance as the Son of God. Everything, you know, everything is his. And in the light of his authority, he commissions his followers. They're called to this active, adventurous work. Go out, make disciples, teach. You know, they're no longer... Uh, any l limits on who can come to Christ and who can be baptised. And do you notice as well, baptised into, into one name, in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Here it's, here it's one name, three persons. You know, if you've ever wondered where the Trinity comes from, you know, this is pretty unavoidable. Jesus speaking of one God with three persons. They must be taught. You know, they're baptised, baptising and teaching. You know, come to faith, get baptised. And that's the start of the journey. And then we're all on this, this great adventure of learning to follow Jesus' teaching. Nothing more and nothing less but Christ and his word. And how do we know that this will succeed, this mission that the disciples are called to? Because Jesus says that he will be with them until the end of the age. His presence is the guarantee of victory. Jesus' first title in the, in the Gospel of Matthew is Emmanuel, God with us. And Jesus' last words in the Gospel is that I am with you until the end of the age. He's with us. Amen. Thank you for joining me today and I hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.